Welcome everyone. It's Anthony Harcher for another episode of Me and My Health Ups. Uh, today we are blessed to have uh, Jamie Walsh. Jamie Walsh is a naturopath who works in the Paddington area. And today she's going to be talking to us on female health. And in particular, we'll, we'll be focusing on PCOS. Uh, so PCOS is a condition that affects 10% of the female population. So one in 10 females, uh, uh, you know, the statistics uh, say that it's, um, that that's what it is. Um, so we're going to discuss that more and, and how, you know, what is the condition? Um, how does it come about? Uh, is, and what, what can we do about it? So uh, without much further ado, I'd love to welcome Jamie. Hi, Jamie. Hey, Anthony. How are you going? Excellent. How are you doing? <clears throat> yeah, I'm good. Thanks. Thanks for having me. A pleasure. Thanks for joining us. Uh, so yeah, really keen to um, just find out you know, a little bit more about you and how you got into the space of naturopathy. Yeah, so I guess um, I've had a lot of health issues and most of them when I was younger were sort of medically managed. But I think um, <clears throat> as I got a bit older and I had some more uh, like chronic health issues and I was sort of recommended different medications and things like that, I think I kind of... Um, got to the point where I felt like um, like there had to kind of be another way to be able to sort of manage things. So I was diagnosed with endometriosis a few years ago and, um, you know, like a lot of the, the treatments that were recommended to me were like really full on medications and surgeries and things like that, which I felt were uh, in some cases probably had the capacity to do a bit more damage than than I was actually already feeling so I think that sort of um led me on a bit of a path to sort of explore some alternatives and then I I'm you know I'm obsessed with food so working with nutrition has always been a big thing for me um yeah and just love working with people as well so it's kind of just a I feel like it's a perfect job for me to be honest <laughs> yeah so you found it's really helped you with your health throughout your years and it's that time to um really give back and 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 give people you know alternatives other options to you yeah. know support their conditions and to um you know really accelerate and you know be you know work synergistically with um medical um intervention. totally yeah 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 so, it's um, a no-brainer to me i think work, being able to work together with um yeah, conventional medicine makes sense to me. Absolutely, I, you know, because it it's just coming from a, another angle. Uh, it, it puts the power back into the client, doesn't it? In in a sense, it's totally. something to do with medical intervention. It's really out of their control, and you're putting a lot of belief into the medical system and the, I guess, the specialist. Uh, whereas this is something that they can proactively do. So it probably really helps with that that mindset in terms of, yes, I'm working, you know, I guess with, you know, working alongside medicine with the condition, we're both, you know, working together to, uh, to get an outcome. Yeah. I'm preaching to the choir. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and uh, so you, you very much specialize in female health and what do you find you're attracting a lot of when people, you know, when your clients come to you uh, with female health conditions? Yeah, so I mean, I do one of my favorite things to work with is PCOS, like you said. So I do see um, quite a few women who are struggling to sort of manage their PCOS. Um, and, you know, like you said, it, it is a really common condition, but it's also um, because it is a syndrome, it sort of looks really different in a lot of people. So, you know, some women might be, might come to me to um, for help with managing their weight and um, reducing things like insulin resistance. Um, other women are really keen to conceive sort of either now or just have that peace of mind that they might be able to do it in the future. So <clears throat> I'm kind of, um, yeah, like a lot of women are coming to me with irregular cycles or absent periods and things like that. So that's probably one of the things I work with most regularly. Um, and then I also see a lot of things like um, period pain and chronic pelvic pain. Um, yeah, which I think is really, yeah, nutrition and herbal medicine and things like that can be just super helpful. So 
Yeah, those are probably the main things I see. And then things like PMS as well. Any sort of, any um, symptoms within that sort of reproductive spectrum is sort of what I work with most closely and what I really enjoy doing Yeah, as well. It's great. Uh, you know, it's, it's awesome that you're, you know, so passionate about it and, you know, that really makes you a great practitioner and, you know, be able to help these, these women on their journey to, um, you know, better cycles and, uh, you know, more symptomatic relief and hopefully, you know, get to the bottom of it and really, you know, heal, heal themselves. Uh, so totally. That, yeah. yeah it's, it's really awesome to hear. Uh, in, in, in terms of like, you know, we've just spoken about these, you know, these general symptoms, some related to PCOS and some just more related to uh, the menstrual cycle. Yeah. Um, what is it when you're, you know, in front of these women and you're looking, you know, deeper as to what the underlying root causes are behind some of these symptoms? So like, you know, the irregular cycles, the pelvic pain, um, mm. Yeah. So is it, is it, you're finding that, is there a common attribute uh, behind this that you're constantly addressing? Um, I feel like, <coughs> excuse me, stress is a massive factor in pretty much for pretty much all of the women who I treat, um, whether that's kind of like sort of ongo ongoing psychological stress, even, you know, I feel like even for us who live in a city and have, um, you know, like a, a busy work life and things like that. It's kind of something that you can't really escape. Um, and I feel like, you know, the connection between the brain and the way we perceive stress has such a big impact on the way that our hormones work. Um, and especially with things like pain and, you know, how irritable we're feeling or short tempered we're feeling in the lead up to our period. Um, all that is so deeply impacted by stress. So that is probably something that I, um work with like quite commonly with a lot of my clients it's always sort of an underlying thing um but another thing that i feel is really important is to address is any sort of deficiencies that the clients have because um you know that can have a massive impact on the way women feel throughout their cycle as well even just things like um low iron for example can have a massive impact on somebody's emotional resilience and their even their blood loss, how um, sort of heavy their period is. Um, so, yeah, I'm kind of always, kind of always have those kind of things in the back of my head as well with pretty much all of my clients, yeah, regardless and, of what's going on for them. And how, how, how do you help in relation to the stress management side of things? So what are the common areas that you like to address when it comes to stress management? Yeah. So, I mean, I think a lot of it comes down to lifestyle. Um, and like I said, a lot, of, a lot of us have really busy lives and there's sometimes not a lot we can change in terms of, uh, you know, the hours that we work throughout the day or our workload and things like that. So for people, for women in those sort of situations, I feel like it's really important to see where you can get, for example, little pockets of rest and relaxation throughout the day. Um, where you can really be uh, present, you can sort of focus on your breathing or, you know, um, sit at a window and feel the sunshine and the warmth on your body and things like that. It's kind of like those really small practices can kind of take us out of that flight or flight, sorry, the fight or flight response. Um, and then that kind of really changes the way over time that our body reacts to stress. And I think that that has a really lovely knock on effect to the way that our hormones are working and how we feeling throughout the cycle. Fantastic. And so what are the, some of the symptoms that someone may be experiencing when they're in this fight or flight uh, situation? So I'm just wanting to help the viewers with, I, just to recognize you now be aware of that you know that stress coming on and to you know to switch to some of these practices that you mentioned such as you know drawing the attention to breath or just feeling the sun and, and really getting present you know in terms of connecting with your senses so what, what, what would be some of those um, sensations or uh, that they're feeling when they're stressed yeah so I mean a lot of people will find that their breath they sort of um, will start to breathe more shallowly. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of has a bit of a feedback system with the nervous system in that it sort of, um, you know, like it kind of perpetuates that stress response. So um, 
that's sort of why I always suggest deep breathing to people, um, which is a really simple thing that they can do. Um, so I think, you know, the ways that you would sort of know that you were in that fight or flight response was so sort of the shallow breathing, um, sort of, you know, feeling anxious, like maybe having um, sweaty palms or not really being able to focus or not being able to kind of, um, you know, like kind of uh, enjoy things or um, sort of get tasks done, just things like that. It's, it's sort of, it's a little bit different for everyone, but those are kind of some of the common symptoms that people sort of experience. Okay. No, that, that's really helpful because I think, you know, it's that element of being aware that they're coming on and then being able to address it. And so you've given some useful tools there in terms of, you know, connecting with the breath. And, and is there a particular breathing exercise, given that there's so many that you'd like, you know, you tend to recommend over others? Yeah. Um, one that I find really easy and really useful to use is just um a breathing pattern so you're breathing in for four seconds and yeah. then you're holding the breath for two seconds and then breathing out for two seconds okay. um and that is uh again like really effective for getting back into what we call the parasympathetic nervous system um yeah. and out of that stress response so it kind of just slows everything down uh and it's just a really easy way to sort of um calm yourself down it doesn't even have to be for very long and it's something that you can kind of uh, insert into your day at work or um, you know if you with kids or anything like that it's just really simple and you can do it at the same time as you're doing other things. Fantastic um, so uh, over to PCOS and you know I, I assume you know some of these things that you're mentioning are helpful uh, you know if you have the condition of PCOS but I guess firstly what is PCOS what does it stand for and, and what are the different you mentioned there's some different types um, of PCOS. So uh, yeah, if you could just go through what it stands for and the different types, that would be really helpful. Sure. So uh, it's PCOS and it stands for polycystic ovarian syndrome. So it's basically named after, well, it's got that name because um, under an ultrasound, often the ovaries will appear to have multiple cysts on an ovary. It's kind of, it can be described as like a pearl necklace kind of um, mm -hmm. appearance. Yeah. Um, but it is a syndrome, like I said, so that generally means that it's rather than being this sort of really defined disease that looks very similar in a lot of people, it is more of a set of symptoms. Mm -hmm. So, um, no two women will sort of have the same experience of PCOS or, or the same, the exact same symptoms. So it is different for everyone, but some of the symptoms that are most commonly seen are um, a sort of difficulty managing weight. And that usually happens from, uh, as a result of insulin resistance, which I can explain later. Um, things like uh, excess facial or body hair, or uh, um, women can often get like a hair loss in a male pattern um, okay. sense. So this could be thinning around the temples or, um, at the at the back of the head um a lot of women can suffer from acne um but mm -hmm. one of the main sort of things um that most women will suffer from is irregular periods so um you know six or less sort of periods throughout the year or yep. um a lack of periods okay and uh you mentioned insulin resistance you want to just go into a bit of detail around that and what, you know, yeah, like, sure. Yeah, yeah. So, a lot of women, um, a lot of women with polycystic ovarian syndrome do have insulin resistance, and that just means that. Um, so, insulin is kind of it's a hormone in our body that acts to sort of transport transport the glucose that's in our blood after we've eaten a meal into the cell, so that it can be used for energy. Yeah. Um, so it sort of like knocks on the door and opens the door in a way and lets the glucose into the cell. Um, but when we've got insulin resistance, it's like we're kind of not able to hear that knocking okay. on the door, if that makes sense. Yeah. So um, you need more and more insulin to knock louder and louder. But it just means that the cell is not getting the energy that it needs. So rather than that glucose being used as energy, it can be stored as fat. So a lot of women who have insulin resistance can find it really, really difficult to lose weight. Um, and that can obviously be really distressing for a lot of people because 
you know, a lot of women will get told that, um, you know, to deal with PCOS, you really just need to exercise more and eat less, but it is just so much more complicated than that. Um, yeah, so that can be something that's pretty distressing, but it is treatable, of course. Right. With the right treatment. And so does the insulin resistant go hand in hand, side by side, or is there the chicken and the egg, one becomes first and then the other follows, or I'm just thinking of... Yeah. It, I mean, it is a really, really common sort of presentation with PCOS and yeah. it, um, yeah, like it is kind of hard to know really where everything starts and I don't think we've got a totally clear understanding of how that happens. Um, we do know that women with PCOS do have a, a genetic predisposition, so yeah. it's very common for, for them to have a first degree relative um, who's also got PCOS so that might be their sister or their mother or their um, you know and they might also have a few people in their family who've, who've got diabetes um, but we do kind of know that the insulin resistance does sort of set off a bit of a um, an issue with other hormones so it can cause testosterone to become higher which then okay. causes symptoms like acne and the hair growth and the hair loss as i was talking about okay. um, which in turn sort of makes um the body less able to ovulate so then you kind of see those longer cycles or an absence of cycles okay so where do you start? Like, so, you know, someone's come to you with, you know, either a diagnosis, you know, a medical diagnosis. Like, there's probably a couple of parts to this question is uh, it gets diagnosed by a doctor. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what can medicine do for it uh, in terms of supporting the client? And then they also may come to you as an alternative to come at it from a different angle in terms of, you know, for you looking after nutrition or their lifestyle or, you know, maybe some herbs mm. to support it. So, yeah, so, yeah, just really, you know, if, if that person ha has the diagnosis, what are, you know, what are the medical options? And then secondly, they come to you, where do you start your work? And sure. What, yeah. So if a woman were to go to a doctor and be, diagnosed with PCOS, she would most probably be um, recommended to go on the oral contraceptive pill. So um, that's sort of recommended for women who are not having a regular cycle because it does give you that regular bleed. You're obviously not ovulating, but you're bleeding on a month to month basis. Um, so that's probably one of the, the primary medications that a woman would be prescribed. Um, and then for things like, uh, for women who are suffering from those high testosterone symptoms, so things like acne and hair growth, um, they might be prescribed a testosterone blocker. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then there are also other, uh, other medications that deal with the insulin resistance component. Um, so, you know, a lot of women choose to go ahead with those treatments and that's kind of fine for them and it works really well and they're really happy with it. Um, some women find that either, you know, like you were talking about earlier, they don't feel like they have that sense of control over their health and they, they don't, you know, they're taking the medications, but they don't really feel like aligned with that approach or that they're doing everything that they can to sort of better their health um, through their own efforts. Um, and then, you know, these medications are also not without side effects. So metformin, which is prescribed for insulin resistance, often has some pretty full-on digestive side effects, right. um, which can make it hard for women to go about their lives. Um, and, you know, some women love being on the oral contraceptive pill and other women really don't like it. Mm. So um, I think for those women, um, something like a naturopathic uh, approach is probably more suitable either as a standalone treatment or as a something to do alongside the medications. Um, so to answer the second part of your question, um, yeah, I mean, like I said, PCOS looks different in every single person. So I, would, I treat every woman differently um, and every woman has different goals. So, um, but usually the aim of my work with women is to 
first of all, really educate them about what's going on because, um, you know, a lot of these women have sort of spent years going from doctor to doctor and not really kind of understanding why they might be having, you know, facial hair growth or why they're not ovulating or why they're not having a regular period. And that can be really stressful, you know, when you kind of, your body feels like it's not in your control and there's kind of nothing that you can do to to regulate things. Um, so I think one of the most important roles that I play is helping people to get educated um, because I feel like that gives people a lot more confidence than with the treatments that we go ahead with and they know why they're doing a particular thing um, and, you know, how it's helpful and it makes it worthwhile for them, I think. Um, but usually I'm, I'm working with women to sort of help them to give them a more regular period um, and then also to work on their symptoms, so trying to reduce that acne and some of their hair growth and also by... Um, kind of addressing their insulin resistance to help them to manage um, a weight that they're really happy with. Yeah, because yeah. I, I, you know, I was just, you know, hearing the uh, the medical options around, you know, there's mm. certain drugs and, you know, those drugs really help with the symptomatic picture. Um, yeah. But then you said they come with side effects and that can wear on someone, those side effects. And then, you know, you've, in terms of your approach, it's much more natural. It's them, I guess, being able to take steps as opposed to just popping pills and feel like they're making some progress in terms of their own health and to the benefit overall in the sense that, you know, not only they're working on their PCOS, but it's also going to help with other systematic function and just feel better about them. Totally. Yeah. 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 And I, the other thing I picked up from what you're saying is that psychological element to it like because there's so many symptoms that affect appearance so you know facial hair is vi vi visual um same with acne very visual putting on weight and not being able to you know be the best looking self and yeah so i think there's that you know the thing that you know it's taking over your body uh it's affecting your appearance you're noticing it every day when you get up in front of the mirror and it's really you know it must play on someone's mind as to um really wanting to address this and and looking at many avenues to uh support them on this journey yeah totally and i mean it's no surprise that women with pcos uh, suffer with you know um much higher rates of anxiety and depression than other women who don't have pcos so that's you know i think um like I was saying, a lot of women go for years and years before they're able to find a treatment that actually helps them. So that's a long time to really be not feeling at your best and to not feel like your body is sort of within your control and not feeling, you know, feminine, for example. I have um, a lot of women who I speak to who kind of just feel like they're, um, they're not, they don't feel as feminine as they used to or they feel like their body's not working in the way that a woman's body should. So it's really... I think like that is a really important part of um, treatment as well is to kind of help a woman to understand why that's sort of happening and then also what what she can do to start remedying that, I think. Um, yeah, because it is, you know, and a lot of women are diagnosed in their early teens or late teens and it is like a very difficult time to to be having these symptoms that are sort of, you know, playing a pretty big toll on your self-esteem. Um, it's a pretty True, vulnerable so, age. So many bodily changes are happening at that same time. And yeah, yeah. that would be very stressful. It's hard at the best of times. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and particularly, you know, that, that's at that age where you become very self-aware and um, you get the direct feedback, you know, people are, you totally. know, that they don't hold back in terms of coming forth in terms of the way you're presenting yourself and, uh, yeah, High school but, sucks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I really love that piece of education because, you know, for me, it's it's making them aware as to what's going on. It gives them that underlying why they should be, you know, implementing certain lifestyle changes, nutritional mm -hmm. changes, um, you know, take, being compliant with supplements and, you know, herbs. So I think that's fantastic how you really take them on that education journey and really putting the control back into their hands. 
Yeah, I think it's really important because, you know, at this stage, PCOS is not curable. It is sort of a lifelong condition that people need to learn how to manage. So, you know, rather than someone having to rely on me over and over again to kind of uh, be prescribing things to them or I think like a really important part of the work that I do is helping people to be equipped to sort of take care of themselves in the long term um, because... Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of stress and anxiety that comes along with feeling like you've got a higher risk of developing diabetes in later in life or potentially that it's going to be a lot harder for you to conceive. You know, a lot of women are kind of told in their teens as well that it right. will be more difficult for them to conceive. So I feel like, um, you know, if women can start taking those steps earlier and sort of make tweaks to their diet and their lifestyle and start, you know, getting um, some treatment so that they can ovulate more regularly and manage some of their symptoms, I think um, that's one way to get a, a lot more confidence and a lot of peace of mind in terms of their fertility later on and just their sort of overall health as they get older. Yeah, because I can imagine that fertility side of things really is you know as you get older really comes into play uh you know as you young you know when you're younger it's sort of uh you know it's a, i guess it's a scary thought um because it you know it particularly it sort of reduces options or you know can limit that thinking around options of you know what, what you're going to do when you mm. grow up but certainly as you get closer and you find that you know the ideal soulmate and that partner and you, you, yeah, and you're talking about these sort of things. It must really then come into play and uh, be really concerning. And what sort of success rates do um, PCOS, you know, if they're doing, you know, a very compliant patient, doing all things well with their health and well-being, um, it, it, can, they, can they really improve that fertility uh, success? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, uh, like statistics show that, women with PCOS have very similar rates of, um, you know, having children as women who don't have PCOS do. It can just be a little bit trickier. So, you know, for example, if you don't know when you're ovulating or you don't ovulate at around the same time every month, then obviously it's going to be very difficult to um, know when you're sort of fertile. So that can be, um, yeah, a challenge. Okay. So I think like a lot of the... Uh, it upsets me when I, I hear a lot of women talk to me about, um, you know, when they're diagnosed, they're kind of told that it may be difficult or impossible for them to conceive later on in life. And obviously that's a massive stress that they have to live with for years. Um, but, you know, PCOS is in no way a fertility, an infertility sentence. Um, you know, like there are a lot of things you can do and, herbal medicine especially can be really um, effective in sort of, you know, balancing some of those hormones to, to enhance a woman's fertility and also just that really the basic life, um, diet and lifestyle stuff that we were talking about. Um, you know, all of that can really help a woman to, yeah, for that really just to happen more easily, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, like I said, it's not a, a sentence of infertility. There's definitely a lot that you can do. Yeah, I really like those words, uh, Jamie, in terms of the way you, you, you know, you put it in terms of it, it, it's not that sentence. Um, and, you know, you know, women can get back in control and, you know, do the things that are right for them to, you know, support their health and well-being. And that is, it's very satisfying and uh, enlightening to hear those words from you. So uh, um, in terms of, you know, that may, you know, viewers that are listening to this may know of someone with PCOS or, or may have it themselves. How can they get in contact with you? What's the best way to get in contact with you, Jamie? Yeah, so um, you can get in touch with me via Facebook. I'm pretty active there. Um, or <clears throat> you can visit my website, which is just my name, jamiewalsh.com.au. Um, and you can check me out there, read a little bit about the work that I do and also um, get in touch with me by email. Fantastic. Yeah, so I'll include some of those links when I upload this to the uh, Facebook page and also to the podcast channel uh, so that the viewers can directly uh, contact you uh, if they are um, certainly would like to chat further about their condition or, you know, get someone to you for further support. So uh, 
I really appreciate your time, Jamie, and you know, enlightening us about uh, female health and in particular PCOS. It, it's really been fantastic and you're very knowledgeable on the subject and I, I love your approach. I love how you describe and educate and you know, just that whole thing around insulin, around you know, being that knocking on the door, you know, <laughs> allowing the cell to open up and let the glucose in and um, just those analogies and, you know, it really helps uh, people to interpret what's going on within themselves and better understand as to what they can do to better help that and, you know, help their insulin resistance, help manage those symptoms better and to ultimately heal. So, uh, yeah, really appreciate your time, Jamie. It's been awesome. And just one tip, I'd, I'd love to get your tip as to what's worked well for you in ISO. Yeah, I mean, I think I would probably go back to the stress management stuff that I was talking about. Um, I feel like, yeah, this time has been a real pretty stressful time, even if we don't notice it overtly. There's sort of a lot of underlying stress. So just that stuff of, um, you know, deep breathing, getting outside for a walk, feeling the sunshine, you know, being really mindful when you're eating, when you're having a cup of tea, when you're going for a walk. I feel like that. And also not watching the news too much. That's the thing that I've learned. Stop doing that. <laughs> um, I think those things can be really helpful for staying healthy during ISO. Fantastic tips, Jamie. I love them. <laughs> I love that, uh, you know, the lifestyle ways to manage stress. I think it's invaluable. So easy to do and so easy to implement uh, throughout the day. So, uh, Thanks again, Jamie. Really appreciate it. And uh, we'll certainly have you back to talk more about uh, female health and, and particularly maybe other conditions or maybe we just focus on the stress management side of things or you know, looking at the uh, reproductive cycle and how that can, um, you know, what women can do to better support that. So uh, thanks again and uh, have a wonderful day. Take care. You too. Thanks, Anthony. Cheers, Cheers Jamie. Bye. Thanks.